Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm Scotty. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Scotty. Hi. What a privilege to get to speak here tonight. This is pretty cool. I wasn't nervous until like five seconds ago. Um, my, uh, what it was like, what I did. Um, so I was uh, born and raised in Oakland, more specifically Piedmont. So rich Piedmont kid, privileged rich Piedmont kids. No, I have no doubt in my mind. Um, great parents, great up bringing loving parents, um, an older brother that was a complete handful. So he was kind of distracting them while I did whatever the fuck I wanted to do. Um, and it was pretty obvious that my mom and dad loved me more. It was just, that's how it was. It was pretty shitty for him. Um, yeah, um, started, I mean, it started with weed. So I started smoking weed in seventh grade. And uh, pretty much dicking off school. Um, just finding that escapism for some reason, anything to alter my mind, it was such a big deal to me just to get out of myself or uh, to go somewhere else. Hi, Guillermo. Um, the, I don't know why, but alcohol is the main thing, all right? So I've never drank just to enjoy a drink. It was always drink to get drunk from day one, which was, I don't know how old I was, um, but finding the liquor that smelled like almonds, it was sweet. My grandparents' liquor cabinet, drinking that, feeling weird, drinking more, and then getting sick off of it. But I don't, I really can't remember the last time or ever that I had one can of beer, one glass of wine, one drink. It's always drink to get drunk. And into high school, it was 12 packs of beer. It was never cans of beer, 140, you know, it was 340s. And, you know, it was a bunch of white kids in the Oakland Hills drinking malt liquor 40s, listening to Easy e like thinking that we're the shit, you know, just spoiled, rich white kids. And um, it was fun. I mean, totally carefree. I had no consequences at all. Um, Something out of like an 80s movie, you know, cars, (laughs) cars speeding around, kids having fun, goofing around. No consequences. I got really good at lying to my parents who uh, were working all the time. I had nannies and au pairs, um, you know, that were more fun than anything. Um, My mom was a lawyer. And then she was a judge, and my dad owned a dental technician lab. It's, uh, he makes teeth. Just working 4 a.m., he was out the door. He was back at like 8 o'clock at night. Never really saw him. Never saw my mom. I mean, she was always working. But growing up with a judge for a mother, I got really good at arguing with people. <laughs> um, like, for me to get $20 to go to the movies... I had, like, fucking evidence and, like, PowerPoint presentations. Of, like, every... So I got really good at lying straight into your eyes and convincing people just, like, of ridiculous things to get my way. Master manipulator. So that didn't help in the fact that I am a full-blown alcoholic. And uh, it was... Middle school was a mess because of smoking way too much weed and partying on the weekends with the alcohol. They kind of kicked me out of middle school into high school, like, get rid of this kid. Ninth grade, I was just partying all the time, ditching class. I got a .7 GPA. I got like a D in PE. Um, and, you know, sometimes I have moments of clarity. So I went to my parents and I was like, I need to get out of here. I can't be in this school system, I can't be in this town. I know all these people and they all know me as a party person, you know? It was like, I've never rolled a joint before in my life and for some reason, the moment we got weed, they all came to me to roll a joint. And guess what? I could roll a fucking joint. It was just like, and 
From then on, I was the guy with the weed, guy with the booze, and I was like, I need to go to boarding school. You know, I need to kick my own ass. So they sent me to boarding school in Utah, and I straightened up, and I like completely changed myself. And there was no drugs, no drinking, no nothing, and I had a lot of fun. But then, when I would come back for the weekend, they would say, "Oh shit, Scotty sent him home." Like, because it was just like a hurricane. I would come in. It was literally 90 miles an hour on 13 mushrooms, high, drunk, blasted Boston on the radio, just <laughs> laughing and just like a, and it's just a tear for like three or four days back to boarding school, just like clean cut. So just whenever I had access to any booze, any drugs, do all of it, all of it, all at once. Um, so then I started manipulating at high school, even just without the drugs or alcohol. I started working the system to where I wasn't going to class and working the system. Fuck that. They kicked me out. They didn't invite me back. Um, I was troubled. Um, so I came home. All my friends had gone to college. I came back, dropped a grade to try and go back to high school with the, under, the kids under me. <laughs> I was still known as the guy who smoked weed, so yeah, I was the guy at his parents' house smoking weed and getting drunk and being, it was just bad. Luckily, I had a girlfriend who watched the Food Network, <laughs> and one morning I watched Japanese Iron Chef, and I fell in love with cooking, and I'm lucky that that's what I'm good at, and that's what I love, and that's what I started doing. So 2002, I got out of cooking school. And uh, it was mostly just, I look at it as an education, shitty jobs, working 14 to 16 hours a day, drinking until blackout at the end of the day, every day. <coughs> no real social life, but just working, 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 cooking, cooking, cooking. DUI in 2005. I didn't tell anybody, especially not my mom. So I've got a warrant for a DUI. I just started riding bikes, but I kept cooking. <laughs> And so, I'll try and speed up the timeline here. Just a big blur of a lot of drinking progressively going from beer to wine, then to hard shit. And uh, got another DUI, somehow got away with that, only spent the night in jail, they let me go. And I didn't tell anybody, so now I got two points out there. Um, got my dream job down at Facebook, running, <laughs> helping run the campus down there, cooking, like super dream job. I got the job, and I knew on the first day that I was going to lose the job. I was in my car crying after I got the job, because I knew I was drinking, I was driving dirty, going down there. So yeah, I lost the job. Got a third DUI, Santa Rita, for 30 days. First thing I did when I got out, I bought a pint, I got drunk. Um... It was downhill from there, pretty hardcore. Uh, finally, was homeless for two weeks. Went to the only place I could find, Salvation Army. I went there, and they hit me with a big dose of humility. I was just about this big in that place. That was really good. I actually worked AA finally. Did the steps, got a sponsor, did all that. I had about five months, three weeks. I thought I was going to get my job back on Facebook. I thought I was going to get all these things. <laughs> Two things didn't happen, and I wasn't ready for it. I thought I was all prepared. Bam, I started drinking again. So, just recently, you know, I've got a little over three months, but I was out for a year and a half. Um, I got so bad, I was in the Oakland Hills in Redwood Regional Park for nine months, homeless, I had built a fucking cabin in the woods, <laughs> little shelter, had a little campsite, and was stealing a fifth of vodka every day. You know, like a zombie, I could put together maybe 70 hours of memories. Autopilot, just no self-worth, not cleaning myself, not talking to anybody, completely alone. And... Woke up on a Saturday morning after blacking out on a Friday night, after nine months, 
And I was like, I'm tired. And I don't know why. I don't even fucking question it anymore. But I walked down to Rockridge Fellowship again for the millionth time. And just walked in and kept on coming back. And I was homeless up in the hills, but I kept on coming back and I wasn't drinking. But right when I got in the fucking door, it was so much easier. Why can't I remember that when I go out? It's so much easier. And this time around, I put myself through the ringer so badly that now I had to strip myself down. I just don't give a fuck what anybody cares about me. And I can just relax and do what's asked and work the program. And it's just, I had to put myself through hell. And I think the message that I get to bring is that Yale or jail, right? It's like I had everything put in front of me. And everybody ends up in the same place. And it's just alcohol. Um, it's been hell, but I'm so grateful for it. Would I be half the man I am today? No way. You know, all that privilege and stuff, and it just, now I can tell people out. Uh, I actually am grateful for things. I, I like to say I don't, I don't really pray to anything, but I'm grateful every day for every last thing that I have, and I think that's a form of prayer. If you can be grateful for everything. It's pretty hard to throw a pity party when, you know, it's like, I, I, I'm grateful for the roof over my head, the food, everything. And, uh, yeah, I think that's all I got for tonight. <laughs> My name is Joyce, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Joyce. Actually, I'm an alcoholic, and my problem is Joyce, so let's keep it real. Um, I'd like to, first of all, welcome the newcomers that introduced themselves and those that didn't. And um, Julie with 42 days, Jerry with 10, Jessica, first meeting. Woo Nisa, did I say that right? Misha. Misha, I'm sorry, my love. 41. Scott, three months. Great message, Scott. Um, um, Neil, thank you for asking me to come and share. Um, I'm from the 408 area code, and uh, and I've been up here before. Uh, I came up here about a year, year and a half ago with a young lady, and um, she shared her experience, strength, and hope, and I'm going to try and do the same. I don't like sharing. I'll just put that disclaimer out there. I like that one-on-one -on -one message that we share where we actually sit down like Bill and Bob just talking. That's where I feel comfortable at. So I'll try and be paved and share. Um, my sobriety date is September 16th, 1995. And though I have not found it necessary to take a drink fix or pill, I've taken hostages, I've taken food coma, <laughs> I've done shopping, uh, bounce checks, I didn't kill my children, and um, I still have a driver's license. Lost a lot of jobs, found a lot of jobs, and um, left a lot of jobs because you guys made it impossible for me to lie. So, those are my disclaimers. <laughs> um, Unlike Scott, which I wanted to drop the mic, um, I am not from a privileged household. I flew on an airplane from the continent of Africa back in 1969 um, with my grandmother, who didn't want my sister and I to get up on the plane and walk around because she felt it might tip over. So... <laughs> Um, I share with my children that I am Kinta Kinte, and they are Kizzy, so that's it there. Um, I really can't share and express how I felt, except for when I, my life and those things that I remember coming to me now and um, at the age that I am, is that my life started when I came to America, and I felt like I was a black oil on satin sheets. And just recently, in the last year or two, I've been dealing with PTSD and as a direct result of dealing with the Biafran war that happened. Um, is that why I drink? 
I don't know, and I don't think so, because um, I have family members that drink, like, alcoholically. But, you know, the book tells us that we cannot tell anybody they're alcoholic. <laughs> so um, I came here. I did a little look. I didn't see anybody that looked like me. We landed up in San Francisco, lived in Half Moon Bay, went to school in El Granada, and everything was white satin. Um, Marsha Brady was my nemesis, <laughs> um, you know, um, I, I couldn't stand that girl, but every day I would wear a mop on my head. <laughs> Tell me, Marsha, 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 Jean, hello. Um, <laughs> I'm so glad you guys can laugh because that means y'all can relate. I can't say, and I'm so glad she's anemic. No, <laughs> whatever she is. And I'm so glad she's got a, a character defect because, damn it, you know, she was just like monkey on my back for a long time. Anyway. <laughs> Anyway, growing up, that's how it was. We uh, we did some geography and all that good stuff, as we always do. Um, I have a biracial family. My father that I carry, his last name is uh, Caucasian. And um, my mom, of course, is from Africa, and she looks like me. And my father looks like Kenny Rogers. So you do the math. There was places we couldn't live. Because um, when one of them went to rent the place, everything looked great on the paper, and the person walked in. And then when the family moved in, there was this from chocolate to vanilla in the household. And they were like, you can't live here. So um, definitely PTSD in America. And um, I remember my grandmother she flew in with us, and when we had a toothache or we were sick with a flu, a little tablespoon of whiskey, you know. So I don't know when I started drinking alcoholically. I just knew there was alcohol around because that's what you put on gums and stuff like that. It was homemade medicine. And um, I remember going around when my parents had a party, sipping behind the can of beer. You know, once in a while they give you a can of beer, but I would get the one with the cigarette butt inside, <laughs> and I would turn green. And... Um, you know, puke in a bathroom or somehow tolerated and went to bed. But um, so that's my experience uh, beginning. Um, I did do other things <laughs> as a direct result of my friends, Tiny and Helen. They introduced me to the Medora kind, the one that you smoke liquor and all that good stuff. And then, uh, but I didn't try the hard or the white horse liquor till I, I got a little older. Um, I somehow tolerated and made it through and high school was a big blur. You know, I was out there smoking in the boys' room and not going to call a high school. So I dropped out and um, started drinking really successfully because at the same time my mom, she's a good Nigerian woman. Um she wanted the rules to be rules, but she wanted us to follow it. And it's very difficult to follow a rule from the country when your parents are working but not telling you, this is something that I want you to continue, dear, you know, but they just expect you to know this, right? And so um, there was that lack of communication. And so I, I didn't feel comfortable at home. I was the oldest. Um, had to look out for a lot of people. They split up because of the pressure of uh, biracial relationships uh, at the time. And um, so I became the second parent. So, pseudo kind of, you know, I could be scolded to do the stuff. And I, I'm sharing this because though alcohol was around and alcohol runs all through my life, the tapestry, the background of my life is alcohol. But the reasons why I drank, I have masks that I have worked through the steps to remove. I found out through the steps that I was a chameleon. <laughs> I could blend in wherever I needed to. Um, and these are the reasons that I've discovered throughout my life, you know. Um, taking hostages, yeah. But anyway, getting back to it, um, 
things happen. Things happen in, in my life that I just needed to numb out. And I went to the easiest thing. First it was alcohol. And then it was other t- forms of forms of alcohol. Um, I respect the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. I came through Cocaine Anonymous, but we use the book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, so I believe in that. And though I do not disrespect any other 12-step program, I try not to dwell on the drugs, but the reason why I did what I did. Because that's the whole thing. Today I can stand here and tell you when I'm on my knees, when I was out there, it was not because I was praying, <laughs> but it was just to get next to that person, to get that next hour, next 20 minutes of being checked out. You know, it was to not dwell with the problems, you know, um, so I, I worked at Moffitt Field for some time and um, partied the hell out, okay? These Navy guys know how to party, okay? We had stuff all the time, brown bags full of stuff, every day, every night, you know? So I said, I'm going to join the military. So I went back to high school, uh, adult ed, and graduated with my high school diploma so I can go join the military. And, um, of course, there's that geographic again. And I think I lasted two and a half years. And there I was. I found myself. I manipulated. I lied. Uh, I, I didn't steal. But you might as well say I steal because I was driving someone's car and everybody thought it was my car for about a year. <laughs> but he was, in, he was in transportation. He could have all the military cars he wanted. So, you know, he let me have his key. So it was my car, you know. Um, but I drank and drank. And we were in the Mojave Desert. So have you ever been through the Mojave Desert, California City? Nothing is there but Edwards Air Force Base. So we're like, I'm not going to drink again. And get up the next day. It's like, who's getting, okay, all right. Who's going to have the barbecue, Okay. And at 2.30, when we got off, we were right back where we started. And it just never ended until they finally um, gave me an under honorable discharge, yes. And that was one of my consequences started. But I said, can I get a job? They said, yes. I said, let me out. So I never felt the consequences, though I didn't, again, I was masked. I was manipulating. I was chameleon. I, I just couldn't for the life of me. And I like to love this part of the text of Dr. Bob, I mean, Dr. Uh, Silkworth, where he talks about, let me get to it because I hate to paraphrase. In uh, Doctor's Opinion, he says, men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. The sensation is so elusive that while they admit is injurious, they cannot, after a while, differentiate the truth from the false. To them, their alcoholic life seems the only normal one. And I lived that way for 26 years. Literally 26 years, that was normal. I had to drink better than you so I could fit in. <laughs> I had to come in with the first check so you can bring out your check and all that stuff. Um... I didn't understand people putting on their coats and women in their stockings. Yes, back then we wore stockings. Don't worry. Uh, I'm going to work because I was just coming in, you know. Um, I remember people crossing the street, walking on the other side of the road when I came. Um, Somehow I came out of the military and I was able to Attain a job, I, I relate it, because uh, when you talked about your dream job with FB, because I worked uh, at a prestigious at that time in the 80s, Sun Microsystems, before they went public. And that job was great, but I was drinking and using, and then there was this thing called crack cocaine that came out. 
And I, oh, I forgot I had twins in between all that. So somehow I had twins and crack cocaine, and I I got married to some. <laughs> I got married to somebody that I was in love with the idea of being in love, and so he, you know, he's the sea bearer of my twins. And um, <laughs> but the crack was more important. The alcohol and the crack was more important, and it took me out. And I left that job, and I took the money, <clears throat> the stocks, and smoked it and drank it and ran them up within six months with children. Because I couldn't, what the hell do you do with one child with two? What the hell, you know? And um, their father was uh, Mike Tyson without a, a belt. So, you know, that just helped me numb some more relax some more, and I, I just continue to say that this is normal. And I found people who like me that did the same thing I did and um, became pregnant again, and he's 28 now, and I'm standing here because I've already worked the steps. I don't know who his father is. My son knows this, and it's okay because he knows I love him, and I'm sober. And I became sober while he was still young. My children don't remember me running them through the shit that I ran them through. But they know that if I leave today, I'm not coming back with Uncle Henry, a bag, or not coming home at all. I'm coming home. And I'll be sober, and I'll be rational. <laughs> and I'll sleep well, and I remember where I was the night before, which is a big difference in my household. Um, I got into sobriety because that twin boy of mine in 95, we were evicted. We were living on somebody's couch slash floor. Um, and, um, my eight year old son was laying next to me as I was coming to, and he said, mommy, I know you're sick out of the mouth of days. That was my moment of clarity, folks. I didn't know what sobriety was. I didn't know what AA... Well, I kind of had an idea once upon a time. The only time I got in trouble with drinking and the cops, they put me in a holding cell in my pajamas and luckily offered me 10 AA meetings and then dropped the case, as long as I don't do it again. But I never... That was years before I came in in 95. And I went to the shelter with my children, and I started something. I went to meetings, didn't like you people. I looked at all the differences. You didn't look like me. You talked about this higher power, this relationship, all this good stuff. First things first, think, think, think. I'm like, who the hell? I am an itch, you know, with a B, and you know, I am a good one, you know. Here I am, and in in my heart, I was mad at y'all because y'all had some of the things that I I wanted. I didn't want my children to go through the crap that I went through, but they were right there next to me through it all in my disease and everything. I know that sounds selfish, but this is my story. I wanted somebody to take them, but. My God has another plan. Truly, I believe that my God brought me into this fellowship, and you guys brought me back to the God of my understanding. And in our text, all it talks about is a relationship with a God. It doesn't talk about a relationship with a husband or wife and everything. It doesn't promise you that. In fact, our text doesn't promise you that. A job, no job. Wife, no wife. But we will teach you how to get sober. And that's what you guys did here. You guys taught me how to do this without changing, altering anything internally. It is an inside job. Um, the first sponsor I got, I just like the way she dealt with her kids because I was, I was yelling at my kids. You remember that movie, um, The Exorcist, where she had to and she puked out green peas? Well, that's me. 
going home every day. I was like, why are you talking to me? Come in. I was just all on edge. It's like, oh my God, shut up. Shut up. Who the hell? <laughs> and it was just my kids were like you know and my children were like is she gonna use please let her use <laughs> I know <laughs> you know my kids were just pushing all the buttons just hoping that I would use so they can just go back to being the parent my children were the parent and I was the idiot or whatever I was I can't even say what I was because I was not alive but little by little, I got sober, and Deborah taught me how to work with my children. In fact, my grand sponsor came to me one time because my sponsor couldn't tell me. My sponsor was soft, loving, you know. She says, you cannot hug anybody in these rooms and not go home and hug your children. How can you be with people for an hour and hug them and talk nicely and kindly to them and be with your children all day, all week, and not do the same? So I was on a diet. <laughs> I could not talk to you guys unless I talked to my children the same way I spoke to you in these rooms. <laughs> Duh, you know? <laughs> These people that I swear I loved, that they were my backbones and I was disrespecting them. I could not ask for respect for my children if I was not giving it to them. So the text again teaches us how to become the person we were originally to be. I've turned out to be a mom. I won't say a fabulous mom, but I didn't kill them. <laughs> they are 30 years old now. They're adults. And my youngest is 28. They've been through college. Some of them have dropped out. That's okay. Not a, College is not for everybody. Um, I have the keys to my mom's house. I, I revert back. When I first got kicked out before we went and slept on the person's couch and everything, I went to my mom's house and I said, can I leave my kids here? She's like, no, you can't. And I'm so grateful she gave me that tough love because I know that if she had allowed me the opportunity to leave my kids there, of course, you know how we do. I'll be back. I'm going to the store to buy a pack of cigarettes and I come back for six days. She gave me $20, our bag of clothes, which was trash bag full of clothes. And that's all we had from my mom. That's why we started surfing, floor surfing with other people. She did not allow me the opportunity to leave my children with her. And I'm grateful for her for that. I do have her keys to her home. In fact, um, I thought I was going to be late coming here. Truth now. Here goes the truth. Um, my mom has been sick for the last um, few months and been in ICU. And she just got transferred to San Francisco. So I was there with her all day and making sure her routine and her rehab is going, acute rehab is going well. And then I got turned around and I started going back towards South San Jose. So I had to make a U-turn and figure out how to get back across the bridge to Oakland. So I'm so grateful I got here before 8 o'clock because I was like, shit, 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 shit. But anyway, um, the relationship with her has been great. In 2004, she had a stroke and I was able to leave my job at that time and care for my mom and got to know the woman, the daughter. And not only make amends by verbally, but actually make a living amends to her by giving her back. And she's one of the living alcoholics that I know about um, that we deal with. You know, she, she had a stroke in 2004, and she was drinking Behringer like it was the thing to do. Behringer in the morning, Behringer in the afternoon, Behringer all day long, you know. And um, and the stroke kind of kept her dormant, all her illnesses and everything, diabetes and all that. And she, she was able to sustain that for 12 years. And um, so we had a good 12 years. I was her road dog. We went 
traveling and everything like that. And like I said, I was able to make a living amends to her. She had recently just had another stroke. And all those issues that we talk about in Living Sober, if you have never read, read Living Sober, please do. The pneumonia, the heart disease and all that due to our drinking surface. My mom now has trick dialysis, feeding tube, everything that we hear and experience of our friends that have been in this disease happened. And it's, I'm watching my mom go through this. So, but I'm here and I haven't taken anything. I Services, I've stepped back a little um, in doing service. I have to. Uh, Self-care. Um, I've been trying to promise myself to do 90 meetings in 90 days, but since I live in San Jose and she's up here in San Francisco, it's kind of hard to do that. I mean, I could do it, but, you know, I, oh, I, I'm working, I'm responsible, you know, all that stupid things that we get when we get here, you know, responsibility and that shit, you know. So <laughs> anyway, I'm so grateful that I'm able to give her flowers while she's alive. I'm so grateful that I'm able to see her and know exactly in my heart what she's going through. And I have a God of my understanding that intuitively tells me what is going on with my mom, and I don't judge her. I do not look down at her and say, oh, see, that's the direct result. I was 12 years sober when you got sick. No. She's another child of God, and this is her journey. And I'm honored and privileged that I'm walking alongside her. Last, uh, what I do with my children, I sponsor my children. I know that's sad to say, but I do. I do. I tell them the facts, just like your sponsor does. I show them the evidence, and then I'm hands off. There are 20 now. They drink. They know. They know mom is an alcoholic. They know I don't drink. I don't use. But they also know what the issue is if they continue. And they know, hopefully, prayerfully, to come to me. You know, because we have depression in our family. We have all these different issues that come up that just makes it so great just to numb out. So I try to be a living example. I try to be approachable. I try to show them progress, not perfection. You know, I'm just going to touch a little bit on this on page 69 in our big book. It talks about sex and more sex and no sex. I haven't been involved in a relationship because I've been learning about me. And I I like it. I can get up and go when I want to go. If I want to have cereal at night, I can have cereal. <laughs> it's just so much easier. But, you know, I have not taken any hostages, so you guys are safe today. Thank God. Yes. Yes, there are safety numbers. No. Um, life is good, you guys. It's hard. It's challenging. Things aren't great. Financial insecurity still baffles me. But I do pick up the phone when my bill collectors call. <laughs> and I speak to them nicely. And I make arrangements. I don't dodge them. Um, I'm leaving a job this coming Friday that I've been at for two years. They've taught me a lot. I'm still with the same company, but I'm taking on another position. And AA is going with me. You guys have been with me 22 years, and you're going with me because I don't know what else to do. Some days there's nothing going on. As long as I don't take anything, that's a miracle. As long as I don't take any hostages and I don't hurt myself or hurt others, that's a miracle. I have a roof over my head. I've been at the same address for 19 years. That's a miracle. I have the same phone number. That's a miracle for somebody that knows geography so well. I, I mean, I used to be, oh, never mind. I don't do a lot of drunk a lot, but um, I have siblings, and I'm watching them try to give mom now flowers. She can't speak to us. She can't tell us her deepest, hardest. And I'm learning how to love them where they're at. That's tough. Because I'm selfish. 
I'm so, don't, they don't know how I feel. Tomorrow is Sunday. I'm so grateful because I'm going to stay in bed. But my 30-year-old daughter wants to have brunch. So I'm going to wash my ass and show up. Because <laughs> that's what I do. That's what you guys have taught me to do. Then I'm going to come home and sleep and wake up Monday and get ready to say goodbye to a place that I've been. I've for two and a half years watched death. I have babies, marriages, divorces. And I've been able to hug through it with them, cry through it with them, celebrate it with them. And it's because you guys are with me. And for that, I'm so grateful. Um, I know I'm not profound, and if I missed anything, so sorry, call sponsor. <laughs> Read the book. Get a grapevine. Be of service. Don't be selfish. Be selfless. It comes back tenfold. You guys have given me more than I've ever dreamed of in 22 years. I've done more than I could ever thought of. And for that, I'm grateful. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.